On today's program, floriculture specialist Bruce Dunn has tips to keep our poinsettias healthy and shows us some of the beautiful varieties to look for this year. Kim is keeping the harvest going year round by planting microgreens and Barbara Brown has creative ways to utilize those microgreens. Kim creates mixed containers with poinsettias and our field producer Laura Payne joins Kim to look at sprout growing systems. Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance is provided by TLC, Oklahoma's leading garden center, Southwood Landscape and Nursery, Tulsa's source for great gardens, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. We're visiting the OSU Teaching Greenhouses, visiting with Dr. Bruce Dunn. Bruce, can you tell us a bit about uh, care for poinsettias once we take them home? Okay, so yeah, that's the important part of it. I'd say water is probably the number one issue that people have to deal with as far as uh, determining when to give the, the poinsettias water mm -hmm. and uh, probably about how much water to give them as well. Yeah, they're pretty sensitive. They'll droop uh, quite a bit if you don't keep them well watered. Right, so some people can actually look at them mm -hmm. like this one over here. You can see that the bracts and the leaves are kind of drooping down a little bit compared to the other ones. And if you actually look at the, the soil, if you take, take it out of the, the pot itself, you can see that it's that it's fairly dry as well. Mm -hmm. okay. And I, um, a lot of times the poinsettias are sitting in a foil wrap, um, but if we water them in that, then you have all that water collecting in the bottom and the plant's just sitting in that. That can't be good for the roots. Right, so that's an important tip. So if they come with the foil hat uh, at the base of those, whenever you water those, make sure to remove that foil hat. And when you water them, go ahead and soak all the way through the, through the media itself. So give them enough water that you see water come back out. It's not very good that if you give them just a little bit of water, then maybe some of those roots won't get enough water. So hold them over the sink. That's what I usually do. Bring them to the kitchen sink and water them until water's running through the right. bottom of the container. And then you can put the hat back on after it's finished watering. But if mm -hmm. not, then you have capillary action and it's going to pull that water back up into that plant. It's going to stay wet and eventually it's going to rot out. Okay. okay. And I've got, got a plant here. And so a lot of the symptoms, so this kind of looks like one that's maybe wilted. So that's mm -hmm. another important thing to consider is that take a look at it as well. But you can see that down here in the media itself, it's wet. The mm -hmm. pot itself is pretty heavy compared to that one over there that was really light. The media is darker as well, so you can mm -hmm. see that it, is, that it is pretty wet. So in this case, if you flip this pot over, and a lot of these roots in here are brown, mm -hmm. and so this one's actually rotted out, so yeah. it stayed too wet. And you can see in, in this one the nice white color of a healthy root. It's a little, right, mm -hmm. right. So it's important to, to look at the plant, and even though it starts to... Uh, droop a little bit to understand make sure that it's 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 uh, drooping because it doesn't have enough water and not that it has too much water in it. Um, so other than water what is kind of the environment the ideal environment for the plants once we bring them into the house? Okay so these are tropical plants they're they're from Mexico but they do like typical house temperatures about mm -hmm. 65 to 75 degrees. Okay. The important thing is to keep them away from any kind of drafts. They don't like anything cooler than about 50 degrees. Mm -hmm. So we, want, we don't want to put them right in the window. Um, they, and also, not just for the drafts, but they don't want that direct light, more of an indirect light. Correct. Correct. So they, they, they prefer about uh, six hours of indirect light. Mm -hmm. And so and that's a, 
and it depends on where your um, light source is located. So if you have southern windows, they're going to get a little bit more light than mm -hmm. if you have north windows or east or west facing windows. Okay, so we just want to be careful, keep them back far enough that they're not right in the sunlight, but getting plenty of light throughout the day. Correct. All right. So um, all the plants surrounding us are for your uh, greenhouse production class, and of, um, of course you always try different varieties. Do you have any that are kind of catching your eye this year? I do have some different ones. Of course we have the traditional reds that people like. I think about 80-90% of the cells are the reds, but we also do have some of the specialty ones or the colored poinsettias as well. Okay, what are some cultivars that have caught your attention this year? All right, so some of the different uh, colored cultivars that we have, of course we have an orange one called Orange Spice. Uh, white's pretty popular as well as uh, I think Peter Star White. Uh, Winter Rose is popular, looks like a rose, but it's red colored. Uh, a new one that I'm looking at this year that did well in the trials was this Premier Ice Crystal, which is kind of this, uh, it's like, a, like a, a light red and kind of white to it. It's going to replace the uh, Ice Punch cultivar that we used to grow. Uh, tapestry, it's a variegated variety, so mm -hmm. people seem to like it as well. Uh, all very beautiful. And of course, all these plants are going to be available for sale to the public. Uh, that's the primary fundraiser for your program. Tell us when this year's plant sale is. So it's always the Thursday and Friday after Thanksgiving, the week after Thanksgiving. So this mm -hmm. year it's uh, December 4th and, De and December 5th. Uh, students grew a lot of great poinsettias this year, and then they've also grew a few other specialty crops, uh, some Gerbera daisies, begonias, uh, cabbage, uh, and dianthus as well that we'll sell. All right, and that begonia is absolutely beautiful. So um, wonderful selection available. We'll encourage all of our viewers to come on out and support the program. All right, thanks for coming down. Thank you. know that good things come in small packages and this old adage holds true for our leafy greens. These are microgreens, um, a real hot commodity lately in gourmet restaurants and health food stores. So what is it about these little plants that's so attractive? And the answer lies in their nutrition. These little greens contain all of the benefits of their larger counterparts but in a condensed form. Recent research shows that depending on the variety, the microgreens can hold anywhere from four to 40 times the nutrient content of their mature counterparts. So really a great food when it comes to nutrition. Uh, essentially microgreens are miniature plants. They're seeds that have sprouted and allowed to grow for one to two weeks until they get their first set of true leaves. So let's show how to grow these. Um, we start with uh, potting media, and I just used our normal seed starting mix. You want something that will have a high moisture content or water holding capacity. Um, and I moistened the soil and let it drain. You wanna make sure you have drainage, just as if you were growing any other uh, plant. You could put um, another tray below that uh, to collect any drainage if you need. And then we're gonna sp uh, spread our seeds. And I've pre-soaked our seeds uh, overnight in a jar, and I have a, a mix, like a sandwich mix of seeds in here that has some cress and garlic. Um, I might as well use the water to water one of our plants back here. Okay, and I'm knock, just knocking the seeds back down as I open this. And the seeds are all gonna kind of stick together because they're wet. Um, so I'll just spoon them out as evenly as I can. Um, I'm going to spread these out more thoroughly. And we're using quite a bit of seeds. We're going to have a very dense stand of microgreens because we just want some nice tall shoots. The plants aren't going to be growing for a very long time in this soil, so they don't need a whole lot of room to grow. So here I'm using a serrated knife. You can see that. Um, and that's just to catch the seeds and spread them out over the soil. It's hard to spread them out when they're wet, so I found just a little knife does the trick. And depending on the seeds you're using, you want your seeds as close as an eighth of an inch, uh, or um, for maybe larger seeds like peas, perhaps a quarter inch between them. 
Um, and I, my goal is to just spread these out as much as I can. I may put a little much in, but I'm not worried. I just want a good dense stand. Once you've gotten your seeds spread out, we're gonna dress them with just a little bit more potting soil and uh, just a light coat to cover the seeds, not deep, just barely cover them. Might add a little bit more. And then I'll use a spray bottle to moisten it. The water in the soil below will actually come up and even out um, and moisten some of this soil, or you can go ahead and give them a little spray to get it moist. And now we just wanna place these in a sunny location. Uh, to keep the humidity up inside of there, I'll cover it uh, until the seeds start to grow. And once, this, once the seedlings emerge, I'll remove the cover and let them continue to grow as I have uh, with these. And let's take a look here. I have a variety of crops, radishes, broccoli, and mustards. And the paired trays here, the mustards, these were sown two weeks ago and these one week ago, actually more about six days. Um, and we'll harvest them when our plants get their first set of true leaves. That's the recommended time. So here, the first set of leaves you see are actually called cotyledons. They're not the true leaves. They're um, a source of nutrition for that growing young plant. Uh, but you'll see eventually a true leaf start, which is gonna have a different shape to it and that's when we start to harvest once those come up uh, but you can actually harvest as you go along just go ahead and harvest some of these um, because you want to use them uh, fresh and so you might as well harvest a little bit taste them as you go along you might find you like the flavor better before those uh, true leaves emerge or you can leave some a bit longer and taste what they're like after those first true leaves emerge so to harvest we're simply gonna use the scissors and cut the plants off just above the soil. And so we have all these nice uh, little shoots. We don't wanna take the roots. Um, so we're avoiding some of the contamination issues that you find in sh uh, sprouts. So here I have the roots connected, those I had just pulled off. I can cut the roots off of that. But here we don't have the seed. Um, which is the primary source of contamination. We just have these nice fresh shoots. Aren't they beautiful with that color? They could be eaten fresh, uh, raw in salads, or we can cook them in our favorite dishes. They'll offer a wonderful source of nutrition and fresh food throughout the winter time. Microgreens are something that have not been available to the general consumer very much. In fact, if you wanted to try them, you usually had to go to a high-end restaurant, which most of us don't do very often. So it's nice that we're learning more and more about how to grow them ourselves so we can experience some of these things. But because they're uh, vegetables or produce that we haven't experienced much, we also don't really know how to use them very well. So I'm going to give you a few ideas. First of all, remember that any time you use produce out of your garden, or from the supermarket for that matter, you need to make sure you wash it well. So after you give it a shave, uh, collect them all, take them in, rinse them off well in clean running water, uh, let them drain, and then dry them. You can do this in several paper towels. I don't know if they're going to do very well in a uh, salad spinner because they're so small. Now let's look at what we've got here. I've got several varieties that I've mixed together and as I said I'm just going to show you some different ways that they can be used. Uh, one is that you can use them as a garnish which is the way they're most often used when you go to those high-end restaurants so I've been told uh, and, and that we've got some soup here we're just going to sprinkle some on. Now if you were doing this this isn't something you would do ahead this is something you would do either at the last minute just as they were being served or what I would suggest is that you put the bowl of microgreens on the table with the soup and let guests do their own. They have a, a much more intense flavor than a larger green would, uh, and as a result, the, the flavors are stronger. So you might actually want to ask them to nibble on a couple of them. I've got several varieties mixed here, and you may too, uh, but if you just have one or two, then have them take a few tastes so they know how much they might want to put on. Some of them are peppery, some of them are a little sweeter. 
just a good thing to know as you're approaching it. Another thing you can do with them is use them as a salad themselves or you could mix them in with some other greens. Here I've got some citrus on the bottom, some microgreens on top, and then just a little bit of a vinaigrette that you put over the top. And again, because they have a lot of flavor and we've got the, the acid in the uh, orange that I've got underneath, we're not going to need a lot of vinaigrette, uh, but it, it's uh, just another way to blend those flavors to enhance things. A couple other things I've got here. Uh, one is a sandwich. Now we're all familiar with putting lettuce of one variety or of another on top of a sandwich, but microgreens can do this too. The thing that you want to remember is because they're intensely flavored, you may not need as much. It may look like you're being skimpy with your greens, uh, but you'll get a lot of flavor out of a few. You also get a lot of nutrition out of a few as well, so that while it may look like, well, I'm shortchanging someone on vitamin C or vitamin A, in fact, you're giving them a lot of flavor because of the intensity of the taste there. They also look really pretty. As you saw, they have, some of them have red stems, some of them have green, they have dark colors and light colors. Uh, and simply doing this much can really make uh, that sandwich look really, really impressive and, and attractive and, and inviting. The last one I've got is one of my favorites, and you can do this with uh, all kinds of things, but I'm just going to put some microgreens on top of a pizza. Now again, this is one of those things that you're going to want to let people do at the last minute so that they can get the amount that they want on there, uh, but it really perks it up. It's not as, quite as much greens as you would do if you were actually putting a salad on top, but it adds a lot of that nutrition, a lot of that texture, uh, a lot of bite to it, uh, and it's something they're not going to get at their local pizza place. And if you're using a frozen pizza, this is a really great way to, to perk that up and make it more inviting and add a lot more nutrition to it, which a lot of times we have trouble getting some of those green things in on some of those pizzas that we make. You can do something very similar with a box of macaroni and cheese and having kids put a little bit on their own may entice them to eat some of these things that they might not otherwise get down. I hope you'll give this a try. Microgreens are lots of fun, there's lots of flavor, and there's lots of nutrition. For Oklahoma Gardening, I'm Barbara Brown. Poinsettias are most commonly displayed in a simple foil container, uh, but with a little creativity, we can produce beautiful mixed plantings using some of our common house plants, other holiday favorites, and even tender annuals brought in from the garden. Um, one of the best pairings and simplest are two holiday favorites, the Norfolk Island Pine and poinsettias. They look beautiful uh, displayed together in a large container. Here I have a little asparagus fern to accent it. It even has some beautiful red berries to add to that holiday festive look. Uh, another just common house plant, the Diefenbachia, with its beautiful variegation really provides a nice stage for a deep red poinsettia. Here we're using the Christmas rose. As an uh, understory, kind of in the garden, we might use a ground cover here. I have a spider plant and a coleus cutting um, that we took in from the garden to create a nice accent for that mixed container. One of the plants that I often bring inside over the winter are geraniums. So a great way to use a beautiful red geranium for holiday color is to pair it with a white poinsettia. There's a lot of new cultivars with some uh, striking colors, very bold. Um, this pink is very intense. It looks beautiful against tropical house plant. And here we have this lemon cypress and that chartreuse and pink play off of each other very nicely. Also, the cypress alone has a nice pyramid shape, uh, beautiful for a holiday planter, and it has a lovely fragrance to it. Again, we brought in some coleus cuttings out of the garden, and they just work perfect to flank a container and just add a little more color, a little emphasis. Here we have a begonia, and that purple from the coleus is pulled out uh, in that uh, foliage. The variegated poinsettia looks beautiful with our rosemary tree. This is another pyramid-shaped uh, plant you could find for the holidays. Also very fragrant and, of course, safe to have in the house. Um, for outdoors, you might consider 
um, an Alberta spruce, but even indoors, if you bring this into an indoor uh, mixed container, you can emphasize that with some poinsettias to add a nice splash of color. Uh, here I've mixed different color poinsettias to add to the interest of this mixed container. So we, with a little bit of creativity, we can take together plants that we already have uh, within the house, things we might have brought in from the garden, and create some beautiful containers to liven up our holiday decor. There are a variety of different systems that can be used for sprouting all have the same general concept of providing a structure for the seeds and allowing aeration and drainage. Our field producer, Laura Payne, you've been experimenting with these different systems, so let's go through some of the pros and cons, okay. starting with the old-fashioned uh, jar with cheesecloth. Okay, Kim, um, now this method, it, it worked just fine. Okay. With the jar and the uh, cheesecloth, you know, these materials are readily available for you. And um, I did find that using the cheesecloth, though, you do want to trim any excess because it does hold that water, it creates like a wick, and you're holding on to this and trying to shake your jar, and then you've got water splattering everywhere. But you found those relatively easy to drain? Right. Okay. Right. Very, very easy to drain. Um, if you don't want this ring on yeah, here that you get from, yeah, from using the jar lid, then you could just use uh, a rubber band around this. Mm -hmm. But that also makes it a little bit harder to uh, keep in place when you're trying to right. drain vigorously, get that water out. Right. So building on that traditional system, we have just these mesh lids that are available commercially. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose you can make your own as yeah. well if oh, you're yeah. ambitious. And they have different sized openings. Mm -hmm. Did this work well for you? I really like this method mm -hmm. because this method I could get very vigorous when I was shaking the jar and get a lot of that moisture out. Um, with this method, I also tip them on their side to get some of that extra moisture out before I just left them on their side to drain. And the jars, of course, the mesh comes with different size openings, so mm -hmm. you can increase that as the sprouts grow. Helps right. get some of those holes out. Right. right. Let's move these aside and bring in uh, another method. Uh, this one's a little bit different. Um, mm -hmm. the, this is called the BioSet, and it works with siphoning action. Yes, and I really like this method. Maybe one of the reasons was because it was so easy. Okay. Yes, mm -hmm. you just you put it on your counter, you pour the water in. Let's go ahead and do that. And there's little openings in each dish, each mm -hmm. tray has that, and uh, you can get up to three trays right. in the system. So I've poured the water in, what happens now? So now the water just drips through here into this next tray. Mm -hmm. When that starts filling up, then it drips into the next tray, and then it collects down here at the bottom. Um, this method, I thought, really drained the water well because you've got that gravity pulling the water down mm -hmm. uh, constantly. So unlike with the jars, they're sitting on their side so they can sit in some of that water on the side. But this, it just pulled that water down to the bottom. One complaint I've heard about it is for really small seeds, they fall mm -hmm. into the grooves in that tray and mm -hmm. then they sit in a little bit of water. So yeah. certainly very good for the large seeds right. that we're using. So just be very selective on the seed that you're using in this container. Okay. The next one is the Easy Sprouter. Um, is it easy? Uh, <laughs> well, all of these methods were really easy. This for me wasn't quite as easy though, and I'm, I'm thinking maybe because my hands are smaller. So this, to get the water out, you know, they recommend that you you hold it and you're shaking it, mm -hmm. and it just was not comfortable for me. Okay. Um, and um, then any excess water would set. Um, but when you're when you're doing the sprouting with this, you do want to make sure that you set this up. Okay. It's kind of a two-piece system. The mm -hmm. outer collector has no holes in the bottom to right. collect the water. This one has ventilation in the bottom, mm -hmm. allows for drainage and if you look inside, there's different ridges. So right. when we're so, you can actually soak, soak in this, it. right? Right. By setting it down. Right. And then when you're sprouting, you set it up. Uh -huh. and there's also a small lid. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of works the same method here. You know, the gravity is pulling the water down, but this one, they do recommend that you do the shaking and the, the spinning. And like I said, it was just... A little challenging for yeah, you. Yeah, for me it Good was. for big hands. Yes, yes. <laughs> 
The last system's a little bit different than anything we've looked at. Mm -hmm. um, this is a tray system called the Sprout Master, um, and we've used them. We have alfalfa and some grains, mm -hmm. and um, so the system comes with the trays uh, and um, the, the containers, and mm -hmm. so the tray either acts as a base, right? Right. That we stack on, and then you have some for lids. Right. We also have dividers so you can grow more than one crop uh -huh. inside of here. What did you think about this system? Um, I like this system as well. It was, it was kind of like the other mm -hmm. system where you put the water in and it drains down. Um, I found this one was easy to get the holes. Uh, you kind of separate it out and then you could rinse from, put your lid on and rinse from the back side to get your holes. Oh, to just pour mm -hmm. them out. Okay. So mm -hmm. I really like this method, especially if, you know, you're not growing a whole lot of sprouts mm -hmm. and you can do different, two different ones in one tray. I like this and the bio set are stackable. They don't take right. up a lot of space. You right. kind of sit it on the counter. Right. You can um, keep them covered up, keep your sprouts from greening up, you know, uh, when you're sprouting them and then uncover them and let them green up when you're ready. That's true. Um, and this does come with a larger method, so if you want a lot of sprouts, you can, you can purchase the larger right. size. But for us, this seemed to be just fine. Yep, I enjoyed it. All it was right. fun. Well, thanks for experimenting and sure. sharing these tips with us. Anytime. There's only one more new show for 2014, and it's coming up next week. Kim gets us ready for the season with gift ideas for gardeners. Turfgrass specialist Dennis Martin has turfgrass tips for winter. Certified arborist Brian Eshelman demonstrates how to safely notch a tree for felling. And Barbara Brown helps utilize our leftovers with a divine turkey divan. Join us then for more TV You'll Grow to Love. For additional information, show notes, plant lists, recipes, and fact sheets, visit our website or contact your local Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service office. Segments from this episode, along with hundreds more from previous episodes, are available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Oklahoma Gardening. Be sure to join our Facebook group for information on upcoming episodes and gardening events, photos, and discussions of gardening topics. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens. This outdoor television studio is made possible with the help of our generous underwriters, TLC Garden Centers, Southwood Landscape and Nursery, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery, and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society.